Good afternoon. Welcome to Thursday afternoon Bible study. We we, we want to ask you to forgive us for um, Tuesday afternoon. We had a thunderstorm and it knocked our our uh, internet internet off offline. And by the time it came back on, it was a little bit too late. So we want to come with you this day to after this afternoon. It's something called the birthright. Your birthright and, and God's view of man's heart. Your birthright and God's view of man's heart. Now, birthright would be a part, a particular right of possession one has from birth. One has from birth. Let's just say Genesis 126. And 27 would be a birthright that when God created man, his right, his birthright was to be the image and likeness of God. Uh, we know that man failed. We know that uh, what happened in the garden and we realized. But when God sent the second Adam, God said he redeemed the time. And for everyone that was Romans 10, 9 and 10, they will confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord. Could retain the birthright. We want to look at this and we want to look at it from the aspects of what is happening as far as an assignment or a commission for man's responsibility and stewardship to God. Man's responsibilities and stewardship to God and we want to look at Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, and we're not going there, but we're just going to set the foundation. We want to look at it from the point of view that spiritual Babylon, the harlot, that the kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth, nation, tongues, and people are drinking the wine of fornication, which means spiritually, spiritually means that man and woman has got in bed with created things as a desire to spend their time uh, chasing things on the outside and refusing to allow God to reveal the soul that's on the inside, Psalms 23.3. We want to take a deep look at this and we want to take a deep look at it from the point of view is the, the, the companionship, the process, the, the commission and the communion and then the communication. All of these are important because number one, man was commissioned from the very creation to be the image and likeness of God. If, 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 if what I'm saying is true according to the Bible, then God's first assignment, first birthright, for the creation of man and for the purpose of man was to pursue the image and likeness of God. Being that we have two atoms that we can talk about now because the second atom has already come 2,000 years ago, the second atom has given us a new birthright. We don't have to live the cursed life, but we can live the redeemed life. We don't have to live uh, not knowing, uh, not understanding, or not having a communion with God, because now we can live with God working on the inside of the individual. We are 2,000 years behind the cross. And now we have an understanding that Christ in us, let me say that one more time, Christ in us is our hope of glory. If that be true, we need to take a long look at what God said about what woman is to man by going back and looking at what God said about when he put the first Adam to sleep and pulled Eve from him. Because that would give us a perspective of the communion, of the relationship, of how the church should look at Jesus. It should give us an understanding of the assignment. How the assignment and the, the help meet, M-E-T-T, -T, 
M-E-E-T. M-E-E-T, I'm sorry. How this helped me for the second Adam is supposed to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. She is supposed to be a helper to him. Now, just like the first Adam, Adam was put to sleep in the garden. Genesis 2, if you want to read it. Adam was put to sleep in the garden and therefore God did not make the woman from the dust of the earth, but he took the woman from inside of a compassionate, intimate place within man. He took woman from up under the arm of the man. So therefore the woman can easily say, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, because he took the woman out of, he, let me say this again, he took the woman out of, let's look at the second Adam. When Christ went to sleep on the cross, the Bible said we were crucified with him and we was resurrected with him. He took the church out of the second Adam. The church was birthed out of the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's why the church can say, I am a born again Christian. And that being born again is what gives you birthright, which means what gives you the particular right to possess things from birth. So when you were born again, you possess things from birth. Number one, you possess a betrothment. And that betrothment speaks that as the church, as the confessed person that confesses that I am a Christian, this person gets to be in a relationship betrothed to the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. This is important because number one is we need to understand that anything that is one with anything, that means it's not two individuals. That means it's not separate individuals. That means they operate with an intimate mind. They operate with an intimate love. And they operate with an intimate purpose. So therefore, they're not individually. Because the husband left and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. The reason why God sent his son Jesus, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, is because when God looked at man in the Old Testament, here's two points of views that God had about man. Genesis 6, 5 says, Genesis 6, 5 says, and let me read it, and God saw, this is God describing what he sees about man. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only continuously evil. Evil continuously. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. When you look at Jeremiah 17, 10, it says, 17, 9 is where we're going to go. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try to range, even to every degree, give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So God is describing man's heart in Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it does not matter what you are saying with your lips. It is the heart that God is judging. So the love affair, the communion, the commission, and your commitment and your faithfulness to it, your relationship in thirsting and hungering for it. God is not testing your lips. He's not testing how you gesture with your hands. He's not testing what you do and how you smile. But what he's doing is it says he searches the reins of the heart. So if you have no communion, if you have no thirst, if you have no hunger for God or for Christ in your heart, then you are not in the commission. You are not in the relationship.
you. So we know that under Jesus being born again, we became the second Eve, what is called the help me to Jesus, to the point that John 14, uh, 12 says that he that believe in him, he that abide in him, uh, uh, would do the works he did. Philippians 2, 5 said that we are supposed to have his mind. We're supposed to be like-minded to the point that we think like him, we act like him, we're stewards like him, we decree his law, we establish his will. So we are acting in behalf on earth as it is in heaven. I'm coming here today because I want you to understand something. Some kind of way to report about church became a place we go. But church is not a place we go. Church is a intimate process a communion on a commission and an assignment with communication. And we want to talk about each one of those. We want to have an understanding that in being born again, we have a birthright to be committed to the state and the obligations and the emotional agreement or the pledge to do as we are engaged to assume a obligation. A commitment to this thing. It's something we lay down with. It's something we wake up with. His spirit lives within us. And that spirit that lives within us does not allow us to lean to our own understanding. But to have a relationship with the helpmate being operating in the understanding of who Jesus is. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, in the strong name of Jesus, first and foremost, Father, we come, Lord, to say thank you for all that you are and all who, who you are. Father, we ask that you open hearts, open souls, open minds, lead, touch, bless, guide, and direct. Father, let this rain of word fall down on these, your people. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Amen. So we want to look at the birthright. Number one is the church is a helpmate. The woman was to be, the church is supposed to be to compliment Jesus and his work as we work alongside him. A suitable companion. She was not born of the man. She was born from the man. Let me say that again. She was not born of the man she was born from the man so which means there should be an intimacy there because the closest thing to a god they love you can ever find is a mother's love for her children so the man would think that anything that was born from him bone of his bone flesh of his flesh is a part of him a suitable companion. So therefore, we need to look at he pulled Eve from almost close to the heart of Adam. So the woman would be considered the very vegan. I've heard scholars say that, well, Eve, God didn't tell Eve, but Eve was one with Adam. Don't forget where God created Eve from. She was not created from the dust of the ground. She was created from Adam. So anything that God told Adam, Eve was on the inside. So therefore, anything that God co co commutes, communicates to the woman from the Bible, and us being in Christ and Christ being in us, anything that God's communicate to Christ, he's communicating to the church. Because Jesus came with a 24-hour awareness 
I came to do the work my father sent me to do. So did the church. The help me came to do the work that we were sent to do. No more, no less. But we're going to move on from that because I'm just touching the PowerPoint of this particular sermon. And so, therefore, the man, which would be Christ, will help his wife live up to her potential with thankfulness for God's gift of companionship. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, intimate relationship, the extension of the man. Man will leave father and mother and unite to his wife. They will become one flesh. You can look at Matthew 19, 4, 5, and 6. Matthew 19, 4, 5, and 6. 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Ephesians 5, 22 and 32. Matthew 19, 4, 5, and 6. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. We'll go there. Let's go to Ephesians. Uh, we'll start by being that I'm in 1 Corinthians. We'll start by 1 Corinthians 11 and see what it says. And we'll go to 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9 says. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this caused all the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, we'll look, let me read that one more time. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. The woman was created for the man. Let us look at Ephesians 5.22. In Ephesians 5.22, it says, simply put, Wives, submit yourselves, Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be of their own husband in everything. Now, husband, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ gave himself for the church. Christ gave himself for the church. He was so intimate that he didn't give himself for the world. So John 3.16 is pertaining to the church. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It says in Ephesians 5, Christ gave himself for the church. So therefore, we submit to Christ as a helpmate to him. So what Christ told us was maintain till I come. He says it's, 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 it's like a, a master took a far journey and left his goods to his servants. We are the servants. So the first thing we got to look at, that if we are the church that Christ birthed it at, at, at Pentecost, we need to look at the commission and what a commission is. A commission is a sent out one to perform. Acts are duties on behalf of another, being Christ, because we're the helpmate. In authority, commissions are created with written warrants. Commissions are created with written warrants. Containing the scope of the commission and the extent of the authority. The written warrants, being the Bible, certifies the skills, the powers, the abilities, in the integrity of its battle. Commission means one sent forth with a specific assignment, duty, or task by a principle. Therefore, we are sent forth with a particular assignment. 
We have authority. We have written warrants. We are commissioned according to the written warrants, certified to be skilled and have powers and abilities and integrity on behalf of the bearer, which is Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Therefore, it is important to understand that in this commission, we not only have the ability, we're not only sent to perform, we're not only have a birthright, but we have an obligation to be in communion with him, the sacred right to ingest the spirit, to spiritually connect. We have a Holy Spirit that spiritually connects us to Jesus. We have the word of the spirit that spiritually connects us to Jesus. The communion of him living in us and us living in him is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We are partakers of his divine powers. We are partakers of his divine fruit and character. We love like him. We are in unity like him. We have so much of his spirit in communion with us that we not only love him and love ourselves, but we love others like we love ourselves. Therefore, we have the powers and privileges and authority to commune spiritually in holy communion. So therefore, we have the right to Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3, and that is to beseech ye, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present our bodies, not only to have the commission fulfilled, the assignment fulfilled, but that also we are in such a relationship that we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, and we are wound with what he's doing. Therefore, we have a holy communion that we can present our bodies because we have his spirit, the Holy Spirit. We have his word. So therefore, let us look at having his word because having his word means that we just don't do what we want to do when we want to do it, but we have a communication. Not only do we have an assignment, not only do we have intimacy and communion with him, but we have communications. The word meant to inform, the word meant to inform, to form something within a person by imparting, putting a part of something in them. Which means, not only did he give us the Holy Spirit, but he gave us the spirit of the word to communicate. Imparting, putting a part of himself. That's why it says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He communicates with us. That's why the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because the commandments is what communicates with us and how we learn to love our betrothed to be. The avenue by which Information, communicating, reading the Bible, studying the Bible is the avenue by which information and knowledge are conveyed. The transmission of thoughts, ideas, feelings of this individual and in the whole assembly of the church. So Jesus and God, through the Holy Spirit and by the word, is the avenue that we receive information. Ephesians 4.11 says, Ephesians 4.11 says this, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. This is what he gave. So that we can have the communication. Which means the avenue by which information. And knowledge. Are conveyed. The transmission of thoughts. His thoughts. Ideas. His ideas. Feelings. His love. His peace. His joy. 
His meekness, his humbleness. Of the individual of the whole assembly of the church. Information, sown seeds, education, impartation, revelation of truth. It is the descript distribution of facts, details important to the operation and security of the Bible, of the body, force, and group. Therefore, he is communicating with us, but we must take a long look at why he's communicating with the second Eve called the church. The process of being competent. The process of being competent means to be thoroughly equipped, furnish sufficient possession of required and essential qualifications, skills, know-how, and abilities to function as the worker, the son, the daughter, as the server of the gospel. The reason why we become competent is because he will tell you in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, 2, 3, that he can't use you carnal minded. So therefore, in other words, he's saying, I need for you to be competent because if you are double minded, you are waving in the wind. If you are carnal minded, you are fleshly and you will fight against the spirit, Galatians 5, 18. So in other words, he needs you competent so that you will understand that you will be equipped. So we're going to go to 2 Timothy 3.17. And we're just going to stop there briefly. And when we look at 2 Timothy 3.17, here's what he says. The reason why he is giving you all the scriptures, and the reason why the scriptures need to be communicated to the second Eve, the church, is for this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the reason why he needs us to be competent, the reason why he need to be, we need to be thoroughly equipped, furnished, Sufficient possession of required and essential qualifications and know-how and abilities to function as a worker who properly developed to perform in an office or position. The reason why we need this to answer is in 2 Timothy 3.17. Listen up. 2 Timothy 3.17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, Unto all good works. Let me read that one more time. That the man of God. The reason why we need the communication. The reason why we need to study the scriptures. The reason why we need the, the, the information. The soul see, sowing of seeds. The education. The impartation. The revelation of the truths of the Bible. Is so that we can become competent. That we, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let us go back. Let us go back to Ephesians 4. And when we go back to Ephesians 4, we want to read something that will back up 2 Timothy 3.17. In Ephesians 4.11, we're going to look down. And we're going to start in Ephesians 4.11. And we're going to go to 13, 413. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why do we need to be competent? That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, and who, from whom the whole body, freely joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to effectual working, in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. He needs.
need for us to be competent to hold our position because when you actually go to 1 Corinthians, it will tell you three. Let me stop by here. Let me, let me, it's, it's too important not to go to. When you go to 1 Corinthians 3, we want to look at something. In 1 Corinthians 3, and we just going to hit it and we're going to get up off of it. Here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 3, 3. For ye are not, for ye are yet come. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I am Paul, and another, I am a Paul, are ye not carnal? See, because it ain't about the denomination. It's not about how big your building is. It's all about Jesus the Christ and him restoring your soul and you coming to be competent to be his helpmate. To be a good steward over the precious spiritual gifts and the spiritual blessings that he has left you. But what happens is we are so prone to look at things and have a desire and an appetite for things on the outside that we never use time for God to restore the things on the inside. Here's what he said. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It says that he builds from the inside. So we are so busy looking around for desires and, and temptation, and we're looking around for peace and pleasure in things on the outside, but we don't let God saturate our hearts and our souls and our minds from the inside, and we don't bring what God is doing from the inside of our vessel and our thought process to the outside of our vessel. So we spend time selling what God is trying to do for us as he has given us a life, Genesis 6, 3. He has given us a life to live in time that we might resume our birthright. That is to be the image and likeness of him. But instead of us fulfilling what God wants to repair through Jesus on the inside, we look at things on the outside, desire things on the outside, go after things on the outside, think things on the outside, and never give God time to reveal, restore the soul that's on the inside. We're cheating God. So we are selling our birthright for the things we can find to desire that have been created by man's hands. And won't give God a chance to give us divine divinity to be equipped to be men and women of God, which is our original birthright. We were made to be the image and likeness of God. That's our birthright. It's Pastor Samson. So we'll see you Sunday.